Hello, and welcome to our presentation this evening titled Notable, Celebrating the African American Women of Muncie History. I'm Karen Vincent, President of Delaware County Historical Society and Delaware County Historian, and I will be your moderator this evening. This is a community collaboration between Ball State University Libraries, Muncie Public Library, Delaware County Historical Society, and Minatrista. Our presentation this evening is being recorded and will be available at the Ball State University Libraries Digital Media Repository. So let's start with some introductions. This evening, we will hear from Karen Good, member of the Board of Directors of Delaware County Historical Society, and the Delaware County Genealogist, Melissa Gentry, Supervisor in the GIS Research and Appellants at Ball State University Libraries, Sarah McKinley, Local History and Genealogy Supervisor at Muncie Public Library, Manager of the Carnegie Library, and a member of the Board of Directors of Delaware County Historical Society, and Nayeli Gullion, Associate Director of Curation and Exhibition at Minatrista Museum, and gardens. Before we get to the presentation, here are a few housekeeping rules. You are welcome to keep your video on, but given the number of participants, it would help with bandwidth to keep it turned off. For the time being, we have muted everyone and ask that you stay muted throughout the presentation. There will be time for questions at the end of each section and the end of the presentation. If you wish to ask a question, you can use the chat box. The button to access the chat box is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure that the field is labeled to everyone. This way, all participants can see the question. If you wish to ask your question verbally, please raise your hand. This function is also located in the toolbar under the reaction button located at the bottom of the options. Right now, I'm going to ask everyone who is able to enter into the chat that you can hear us and see the presentation slides. So, okay. It looks as if we have several yeses, so I think we're good to go. Yeah. Crap. Okay. Before we start, I want to let you know how we got here tonight. Several years ago, a few of us got together to talk about celebrating the women who came before, the notable women of Muncie and Delaware County. We wondered if we could come up with 100 women who made a difference in our community. Right now, I believe we have more than 400 women on our list. These women represent all races and come from all walks of life. The one thing they have in common is that they are all notable. So tonight we are celebrating Muncie's rich history of African-American women, many of whose stories are untold. Photographs are rare, and even with the photographs that are held in our local archives, many of the names are unknown. But Muncie has a long history of African-American women working for their community in philanthropic, educational, spiritual, cultural, and social ways. There are countless teachers, actresses, nurses, businesswomen, and activists in the annals. Here are a few individuals in a few groups. One note before we begin. Occasionally, our speakers may quote a newspaper article that uses language not commonly used today. So just to tell you a little about, a little uh, introduction about these women. The Dunbar Club was organized at Muncie Central High School in 1928 as a social and scholastic organization studying biographies and black history. Eventually the club's sole focus was music and the talented group gained wide acclaim around East Central Indiana for their performances. Clubs like Annette's and Entre New provided a spirit of togetherness, providing help with childcare and education, but also hosting dances and social events. The community hosted significant African American women too, like Congresswoman Cora Scott King, Shirley Chisholm, 
and more recently, Oprah Winfrey. And when I said that, I meant Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and Coretta Scott King. So the Holland triplets made national news in 1935 when the mayor's wife asked First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt to name them. In 1967, Michelle Goodall, a member of the senior class, was the first African-American woman to become homecoming queen at Muncie Central. Teachers and college students were some of the leading civil rights activists in the city. And icons of history like Hurley Goodall achieved success thanks to the support of his wife, Redeen, and other women in the community. And the community today includes so many strong women making history with their dedication to service. Now, let's look back at some of the stories. And to get things started, let's go to Karen Good for a story about Lucille Sanders. Karen? Karen, you're muted. Okay, tonight I'm gonna to talk about Lucille Sanders, as Karen just said. Uh, my title of my presentation is A Woman with a Mission. And um, I wanna start out by saying that I was, I was searching and researching uh, for information about Lucille. I found out that she was a very much admired woman. And I came to believe that a lot of her strengths and, and her faith had come from her mother. Uh, so I want to kind of fill you in a little bit on what kind of background her mother had. New slide. Her mother's name was Maddie. Next slide. Okay, the slides are not changing on my screen. Are they changing on yours? Okay. They're changing Thank on you. mine. Huh? I got it now. Okay. okay. Mehdi was born in 1873. And by the time she was seven years old, her mother had passed away. Uh, you just saw a picture of her father, James. He remarried. Uh, and of course, James then would be Lucille's grandfather. At the age of 18, Mehdi married a gentleman. And in less than 18, eight years later, her husband was sent to prison and she divorced him. Then in 1899, Maddie Smith married Marshall Bauer. And in this marriage, um, Maddie's family was very, very furious and upset about it. They tried to talk her into getting a divorce. Uh, she continued to refuse. They kept using the excuse that um, they had found out that she had married a black man and she just, they just felt that she should divorce him because of his color but she refused to divorce him. Next slide. So in 1908, Marshall and Mehdi became the proud parents of Lucille Bauer. Next slide. January 15th, Mehdi's father, James Banatter passed away. And remember James Banatter then would be Lucille's father, grandfather, I'm sorry. Next slide. Just four years later in 1919, Lucille's father, Marshall Bauer, passed away. Next slide. While in the West as an evangelist, Lucille met and married Lawrence Sanders. They came to Muncie in 1932 in the midst of the Great Depression and the two of them worked for two years at the Muncie Mission. While working with the men at the Muncie Mission, Lucille realized that there was no help for the women in the community. In an interview with Bob Bar Barnett, December 14th, 1969, she was quoted as saying, quote, I saw them sent away from the mission because it could accommodate only men. It touched my heart. We took them home when we could, but we only had a four room house and there were times when we had children and women sleeping in every room but the kitchen, end quote. She goes on to say, quote, 
God told me to find a way to help women and children. I figured he would find a way, end quote. Next slide. So on September 14th, 1946, she and her husband took a huge leap of faith and officially started the Wayside Mission with two donations of $100 each and $750 down payment for a house. The money for the down payment had come from an insurance settlement after Lucille's husband had lost a finger in a factory accident working at Acme Lee's company. Their articles in, of incorporation stated the purpose of the mission is, quote, to provide shelter for homeless women and children and to temporarily assist the unfortunate destitute and handicapped. It shall endeavor to provide a wholesome Christian atmosphere and religious instruction. All religious instruction of this institution shall be strictly orthodox and interdenominational, end quote. The articles also stated that the Wayside Mission would be located at 2428 South Walnut Street. Next slide. This is another photo of Lucille working uh, there at the mission, as well as another a photo of the Wayside Mission House. Next slide. The mission was funded by donations only. Here we see a, a photo of Lucille accepting a $100 check from policeman Frank Doherty in October of 1947. Next slide. Lucille and Lawrence and the Wayside Mission were able to help many people over the years. But what touched me the most was the faith that Lucille and the staff and Lawrence had. More than once they were down to their last meal, but food and money or items of clothing would arrive right in time for the unexpected sources. Next slide. Lucille believed the problem of this world was both sin and poverty. She felt that one way to help uh, the people, the women to overcome this was to train the women and teach them skills that they needed to help support themselves. They all worked at the mission and they were asked to attend church services. Lucille felt that in addition to the spiritual values received, the church services served as therapy for the women who needed to mingle with other women and learn that they weren't the only people in the world who have troubles. Also during their stay at the mission, the girls were taught to cook, sew, and keep house. Perhaps most importantly, they were taught to handle money properly. Many of the girls found jobs while staying at the mission. When this happened, they paid for their room and board based on their ability to pay. Next slide. Lucille received several awards during her lifetime. She was included in the London, England Dictionary of International Biographies. She was included three times uh, for the Outstanding and Distinguished Personalities of the West and Midwest. Next slide. I'm sorry, leave it there. Because when Lucille was presented with the Saratoma Club Service to Mankind Award, the president of the club said it was for Lucille Sanders, unselfish and untiring devotion to others, which exemplified the meaning of service to mankind. You'll notice then on this slide, it's an advertisement at ball stores asking for support. Um, in 1975, the mission had provided clothing and household necessities to more than 156,000 families. They provided 297,900 meals, 95,722 beds for the women and children in need. And as you'll notice here, uh, they are asking for support because once again, I wanna remind you that the mission existed solely on contributions of money household goods, clothing, and food from donations. It received no help from any agency. The next slide. 
On the 30th of July, 1993, Reverend Lan Lawrence Sanders, age 87, died at Anderson Healthcare, Anderson, Indiana. He had pastored various area churches for 45 years. His jobs at Wells Department Store and Acme Lee's helped support the Wayside Mission. Next slide. February 24th, 1995, Lucille Sanders passed away. I would like to share a, a newspaper report that appeared March 2nd, 1995 in the Muncie Evening Press uh, about her funeral and eulogy at this time. It said, all kinds of people paid respect Wednesday morning to the life of a woman who gave her most of her 86 years caring for others. Lucille Sanders, known as, quote, mom, unquote, to those who knew her, was buried at Gardens of Memory Cemetery after services at Meeks Mortuary. About 200 people filled the mortuary chapel for the woman who had helped create the Wayside Mission. She brought God down to earth for people, said Lauren Marsh, a local attorney who delivered the eulogy during the funeral. Mrs. Sanders died after keeping the mission doors open at 2428 South Walnut Street for nearly 50 years. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Mom Sanders from December 14, 1969 interview with Bob Barnett. Next slide. She said, there are times when I think I can't take the worry and the work any longer. At times like this, I repeat my favorite Bible verse over and over, and before long, I know I'm right again. And her favorite Bible verse, uh, according to this article, was Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and to those who are called to his purpose. Thank you, Karen. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box now and we'll send them on to Karen. And while I'm waiting to see if anybody uh, puts in a question, I'll ask one. So Karen, does the Wayside Mission still exist? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Uh, does the Wayside Mission still exist? Is there still a Wayside Mission? I have been trying to find out and uh, actually for over a year now and ev everybody I talk to say that they think that it's still in existence as far as helping the girls out through a church. Um, it says that the church moved to South Madison was just one of the comments that came up. Matthew yes. Shaw wrote yeah. that. So it's on South Madison. Thank you. Uh huh. Anybody you, else Matthew. have a question before we move on? Yes, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> ah, so Lucille is my great grandfather's first cousin. She was a remarkable woman. I've heard Karen talk about her several times, and it's yeah. Great and every I have time, a long, so. I have a longer presentation that I give, uh, and some of the stories of some of the things that happened there, and and some of the ways she loved on those girls and. She, I wish I had known her. She just seems so fascinating yeah. to me. I agree. Okay, if there's nothing else right now, uh, Melissa Gentry will talk about African American support uh, for some World War I efforts. And I will move this along. So, Melissa? I, I wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight for our Black History Month celebration. I'm going to be telling the story of a year in the life of Muncie African American women. So it's from 1917 to 1918. 1917 deserves a closer look in Muncie history. As a backdrop, Karen, you can go ahead and advance to the slide. War was raging in Europe. The U.S. was in turmoil with labor unrest, battles over prohibition, race riots, and lynchings. The 1916 Olympics had been canceled, and the 1917 and 1918 Indianapolis 500 
was, were both canceled. And as you can see in the bottom picture, they used the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as a landing strip. Next slide. Muncie had a population of 35,000 with just over 1,600 African Americans. But oh, did they have a power, powerful impact on the community. And most of this particular history started in church. Next slide. In the African American community of Muncie in 1917, three churches were the hubs of history, Bethel AME and Calvary Baptist on East Jackson Street and Union Baptist Church in Whiteley. Next slide. The year 1917 started with the Indiana legislature passing a partial suffrage law giving women the vote in special elections that fall. In May, the Bethel AME Church hosted a Better Babies Conference where the women were inspired to organize the first African-American franchise league in the city, the Booker T. Washington Franchise League. Next slide. Josephine Pearson, a deaconess at Calvary Baptist was elected vice president. 18-year-old Ruth Keith was elected the corresponding secretary. There were 19 founding members of that franchise league, including Josephine's daughter, Nettie Pearson Riff, and Ruth Keith's younger sister, Ella. Next slide. In June, members of that Booker T. Washington League organized a second African-American club at the Union Baptist Church in Whiteley, called the Frederick Douglass Franchise League, which included men. The two leagues joined forces with white women in Muncie to register voters throughout the summer. Sadly though, the suffrage bill was struck down by the Indiana Supreme Court that fall, but these newfound suffragists would mobilize for another battle. Next slide. In April of 1917, Americans woke up to the news that the U.S. had entered World War I. Lydia Nichols, an African-American woman who published a column called In Colored Circles for the Muncie Star, went from reporting about church events to reporting about the church's mobilization in support of the soldiers. Next slide. The citizens of Muncie, most especially the women, waged a war to help the soldiers over there, over here on the home front. African-American women were already working, sometimes at multiple jobs in some of the factories, but more joined the workforce making munitions. But the women were also dedicated volunteers, raising money for comfort kits, conser conserving food and coal, knitting socks, and writing letters. And this story is made even more remarkable by the many teenaged African-American women at the fore of the effort. The Muncie Sunday Star hailed women, quote, the war is our own special affair. We shall work out the war with blood and tears and we shall all be kin, unquote. Next slide. The churches and their associated clubs with many of the same interconnected women did their part as the soldiers of the home front. Next slide. Nettie Riff taught over 300 women how to knit at the YWCA. The African-American Coleridge Taylor Glee Club decided to join forces and complete Red Cross work after their singing practices. Hazel Adams, who was 16, was a gifted soloist who became a dedicated Red Cross worker through the Glee Club. Next slide. African-American children joined the Junior Red Cross in school. They knitted socks and made scrapbooks to send over there. Here are students at Jackson Elementary. Next slide. The Equal Rights Club and the Household of Ruth Club presented a play called The Girls Over Here at Union Baptist Church. Stella Pettiford, age 24, 
performed beautiful solos for the for extra contributions to the soldiers like her husband Ralph and his brother-in-law Roy. Every African American soldier in Muncie received a wristwatch from the community donations. Next slide. Calvary Baptist hosted a dinner slash fundraiser for the soldiers in December of 1917. The grand chorus sang, Alice Wingfield, age 22, and her future mother-in-law, Nanny Finley, performed solos, and pastors from the three churches encouraged the soldiers. The Christmas cantata at Calvary Baptist Church also involved activist girls and women. Juanita Haynes Humphrey and 16-year-old twins Lena and Anna Belt, eight-year-old Eleanor Cloyd, and 13-year-old Goldie Outland. Our young suffragist Ruth Keith directed the Christmas program at Bethel AME with Lydia Nichols and Ella Keith performed. Next slide. But then on Christmas Eve, the biggest event of the entire war for the African American community, a military ball for the quote, khaki clad boys to be at Campbell's Auditorium in Whiteley. The huge auditorium slash arena was used by both blacks and whites in Muncie, but separately on different nights. Next slide. A huge crowd showed up. Lydia Nichols wrote about the dramatic Grand March as searchlights lit up a huge flag. Quote, what cheering it brought forth from the hands and lips of ancient Ethiopian descendants. Soon the flag was hidden to reappear with good old Uncle Sam standing at the right of it and Liberty at the left. Saluting from the front, two soldiers, one in khaki, one in blue, strengthened in appearance by the war nurses, two lovely Red Cross nurses, unquote. Next slide. In February, 1918, Lydia Nichols published in her column part of a letter from soldier Robert Perkins who left for France in October of 1917 to Elsie Powell of Whiteley. Quote, we're having a fine time here. The French people are very good to us. The Muncie boys are all together. We are in Paris, France now. Your brother sends his love and says it is fine to be a soldier for Uncle Sam, unquote. Next slide. Not everything at home was serious though. Clubs hosted numerous Kentucky oyster socials, chili dinners and taffy pulling parties. The war working twins, Lena and Anna Belt celebrated at a big 17th birthday party. There were grand musicals, pie socials, lawn feats, Late summer brought picnics at McCullough Park. Union Baptist Church even hosted a trendy Tom Thumb wedding where children participated in a mock ceremony. Next slide. Some wartime events were historically significant. In March of 1918, Indianapolis, Indianapolis African-American millionaire entrepreneur Madam C.J. Walker came to Muncie and presented a lecture at Bethel AME detailing her business history. The huge crowd included many out-of-towners. Next slide. In June of 1918, Calvary hosted a popular popularity contest as a fundraiser. Three women, Lena Belt, age 16, Bessie Lee, age 19, and Lucille Lucas, age 20, were the contestants. Each was challenged to sell the most tickets. Lena Belt raised the most money and was crowned the queen. Over $60 was raised, which equals about $1,300 today. Next slide. At the 4th of July parade in 1918, money was tossed onto a large American flag carried by workers from Indiana Steel and Wire and donated to the women of the Black Red Cross. The Lyric Theater on Walnut Street presented the motion picture, The Loyalty of a Race, about how well black soldiers were performing in war. 
It's unclear whether African Americans were allowed to attend the showings, though. Our trusty reporter, Lydia Nichols, never mentioned the film in her column. Finally, on July 29th, the Calvary Baptist Church hosted the grand opening celebration of the local chapter of the NAACP. Nanny Blackburn, a writer slash singer slash hairdresser, served on the program committee. Throughout the war, Nanny presented outbound, outbound enlistees with copies of her poems. Next slide. Then in August of 1918, a large contingent of African-American soldiers departed Muncie. They first met for photographs and ceremonies at the courthouse where the Red Cross gave them comfort bags and the Merchants Association gave them cigarettes, a flag and handkerchiefs. Next slide. The day for emotional goodbyes had arrived. Hurley Goodall wrote about how they were, quote, fussed over. One soldier described the scene. The train station was the scene of such crying and hollering and carrying on as you've never seen, unquote. Next slide. That fall, another crisis emerged in Muncie, the so-called Spanish influenza. Another dreaded disease though, spelled the end for an invaluable African-American hero I discovered researching this program, Lydia Nichols. Remarkably, Lydia was writing her In Colored Circles column for the star three times a week at the age of 16. Without her detailed chronicles of the home front, the complete story of Muncie in World War I would not be possible. Her legacy should be more significant. Like so many other women in history though, her life story remained untold. Lydia sadly died of tuberculosis at the age of 22 in 1923. On her death certificate, her occupation was listed as housewife. Next slide. Hurley Goodall wrote that African-Americans, quote, rallied to their country's defense to demonstrate their patriotism and to show that they had earned equal citizenship. But as Muncie African-Americans sadly found out Wholehearted participation in the war effort did not ensure equality. Indeed, in the years immediately following World War I, racist sentiment seemed even more pronounced, unquote. Nevertheless, their combined efforts made history and should be celebrated. I saw a sign on a float in World War I era Muncie parade that made an impression, quote, it ain't the individual nor the army as a whole, but the everlasting teamwork of every blooming soul, unquote. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Let's see if we have any questions in the chat box. If you have anything for Melissa, go ahead and put it in there. I've got loving those photos and they are fantastic. Um, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, uh, Melissa, I noticed on one of your newspaper clippings that it said three soldiers died in the war effort. Is there any more information about them? Uh, Hurley Goodall wrote about them in his book, and he said that the first soldier who was working in Muncie, so he enlisted in Muncie, but he was originally from Georgia. Um, he unfortunately passed away on the boat to Europe, um, I'm guessing possibly of the flu. Um, another a second soldier died in camp here in the, United, in the United States. And again, a lot of those soldiers died of the flu. And then the third soldier um, died at war in World War I in Europe. And I should recommend um, Hurley Thank Goodall. You. Hurley Goodall. We have book. a question. Who is this? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to recommend reading Hurley Goodall's book. It's called The History of the Negro in Muncie. And he wrote it with J. Paul Mitchell. And this is an unidentified woman from the um, Ball State DMR. A lot of the African American women um, are unidentified in photographs. any other questions now for Melissa? And we can take questions at the end too. So um, if not, we will go on to Sarah McKinley who will tell us about Alice McIntosh Kelly. Thanks, Karen. Um, if you go ahead and go to my first slide. Let's wait for it to switch over here.
helped it advance on your page, Karen. Yeah, it has. <laughs> <laughs> we should go to the first one that has pictures on it. So um, yep. it might pop up here in a second. Hopefully. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few second delay on our end. Um, so tonight I'll be talking about Alice Jones, Edwards, Robinson, McIntosh, Kelly. Um, as Karen said, some may have known her as Alice McIntosh or Alice, Ke Alice Kelly, um, but to everyone, Alice was known as a local neighborhood activist, a humanitarian, and the first African-American woman elected to Muncie City Council. Next slide, please. Alice was born Alice Jones in 1933 in Miami, Florida to parents James and Thelma. Alice moved to Muncie in 1952 around age 19 and served in the Army Corps in the Korean War. She used her GI Bill to pay for classes at Indiana Business College, Ball State University, and Savannah State College. She married World War II veteran Otis Edwards Jr. in 1955. Otis tragically passed away unexpectedly in 1958. Alice married her second husband, World War II veteran Carl Robinson, in 1966. Tragedy struck again when Carl also passed away unexpectedly in 1969. Alice seemed to focus her energy into her community work. In 1968, she was employed as the Manpower Coordinator for Action Inc., Delaware County's anti-poverty agency. That year, she worked with local businesses to create a job training and experience initiative for local youth. Alice hoped the program would spark pride of ownership and community development in Muncie. Two community-owned businesses were created for the program, a clothing store in the Whiteley neighborhood, later converted to the INW Mini Mart, and the INW Print Shop in the Industry neighborhood, where 26 youths would be trained in the operation of a business with the goal being to help young people learn useful skills to work their way out of poverty. Alice created the Industry and Whiteley Business Corporation, or IWBC, to fund the program, and Muncie residents were invited to invest $2 or more to purchase shares in the initiative. State officials called the efforts unprecedented, and Alice's innovative thinking, determination, and perseverance were credited for getting this unique program off the ground. Next slide. Alice also took part in community activism. In 1969, racial tensions at the local high schools that resulted in fights amongst students pushed the community to begin having tough conversations and take actions towards healing the racial divide. The Black community began to organize, and Reverend J.C. Williams formed the Muncie Black Coalition, a group which represented resolutions or presented resolutions and calls for change such as the call to remove the Confederate flag as a symbol at Southside High School. Alice was elected secretary of the Black Coalition and also organized a citywide Black student union to give Black students a feeling of solidarity. Alice later joined the Indiana Black Expo's board of directors and helped organize a Black Expo chapter in Muncie in 1973. She was named the youth chairman for the event at the Indiana Convention Center that year. Next slide. By this time, Alice's work with the Industry Whiteley Business Corporation had resulted in its first business activity, the opening of the Black Palace. The business included a dining room, a snack bar, snack bar and community room. She had also opened her own business, a clothing store called the Port of Styles, which was partially staffed by her three teenage children. The clothing shop brought New York styles to Muncie and helped her family earn money for college tuition while also earning valuable work experience. After leaving Action Inc. for a brief time, Alice returned as the agency's first female director in 1971. She resigned from Action Inc. in 1974, but continued to remain active in the community. She was made permanent secretary of the new Delaware County Council on the Aging and Aged, which provided transportation and meals for the elderly. Next slide. In 1977, Alice also joined the Wapahani Girl Scout Council. 
1978, she was appointed executive director of Muncie's Human Rights Commission. There, she wrote the Affirmative Action versus Reaction Project to oversee the employment practices of contractors, suppliers, and vendors who did business with the city of Muncie. In 1979, Alice married her third husband, William McIntosh. By that time, Alice had already accomplished so much for the city of Muncie and the Black community, she was inducted as one of the 12 charter members of the Multi-Service Center's Black Hall of Fame. In 1983, Alice began her political career when she was elected to represent District 6 in the Muncie City Council. She and her opponent, Dorothy Davis, were the only African Americans on the ticket. She also joined a 35 member task force against drugs when the Muncie Commission on Substance Abuse and Drug Related Crime was formed by James Dilley. Next slide. I don't know how Alice found the time to accomplish so much before age 50. She must have had energy to spare. Uh, if you go back one slide, please. While she was running for city council, she was also a restaurant owner. Alice owned the Seaport Restaurant on East Jackson Street, which specialized in seafood. Her fondness for seafood came from growing up in Miami, Florida, where fresh fish was plentiful. Uh, if you go forward one more. Um, not so much the case in Muncie, but owning a restaurant allowed her to have fresh fish delivered regularly. If you look up her 1984 profile in the newspaper, she even shared some of her recipes, including her deep fried catfish, seaport hush puppies, seaport slaw, and catfish in a jacket. And I learned from Melissa today that if you check out the Muncie Notables on Instagram, uh, her recipe for catfish in a jacket has been posted there if you're curious. Next slide. In 1985, Muncie Public Library's director at the time, Arthur Myers, learned of a traveling Smithsonian exhibit titled Black Women Achievements Against the Odds, which was actually put together with research con uh, conducted by Catherine Burt, who was a daughter of a Muncie resident, Walter Burt. Myers thought the exhibit could be complemented with a public program and tasked MPL's community information specialist to put together a panel of five Muncie women to share their experiences in a public presentation. Alice was chosen as one of the five participants. She spoke about her experiences in business and politics, as well as her military service during the Korean War. And a fun fact, if you look at the bottom here, the community information specialist who put that program together was Akila Nosakure, who would later return to Muncie in 2017 to become Muncie Public Library's current director and the first African-American in that position at MPL. Next slide. Alice continued to serve on the city council until she was defeated in the 1987 city elections by Monty Murphy. In 1990, while serving as the coordinator of the Industry Neighborhood Council, she was appointed community development director by Mayor Carey making her the first African-American to serve in that position. Mayor Carey said that Alice was the kind of person who makes things happen. She had built a reputation for obtaining large city and federal neighborhood development grants, including by that time a $225,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Carey also felt she would be the ideal person to help resolve differences and bring out the best of people working within her department. Working with community development, Alice strived to make Muncie a leader rather than following other cities and developing its fair housing plans, improving public housing programs, and addressing the needs of the homeless. In 1991, Alice married former city councilman Daniel Kelly before losing her battle with cancer in 1992. Alice accomplished so much for the city of Muncie in her 40 years here. Her life was dedicated to uplifting those around her and giving them the tools that they needed to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It looks like we have a number of comments and questions in the chat box. Let me see if I can. Yeah, Miss Alice, incredible force. What a pleasure to grow up under her. Uh, Reverend J.C. Williams was our pastor at Trinity. 
Uh, I serve as the current Muncie Black Expo chair. I am loving this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Alice really did it all. So inspiring. And she did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did the best food as a kid. Uh, where were Alice's businesses, Sarah? Um, so I had to look it up, but um, the Port of Styles, her clothing store, and the Seaport Restaurant were actually both located at the same location at different times um, at 1225 East Jackson Street, which is about two blocks east of Bethel AME Church, um, and it appears to be a residential property now. And the Black Palace, um, which was a community center and a snack bar, um, was at 316 South Ohio Avenue, which from what I can tell, that address no longer exists, but it would have been near the railroad crossing, just a couple blocks or so southeast of where the Port of Styles and Seaport were located. Okay. Now, she was amazing. I, she must have had about 40 hours in every day to get done <laughs> what she had done. Yeah, I don't know how she accomplished <laughs> so much, but she, she was incredible. <laughs> Uh, it makes, it makes me was. feel lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Um, if there are no other questions or, or comments right now, we will go on to our last speaker, uh, Nayeli Gullion, who will talk about the Ball family's diverse staff in the early 20th century. Hello. Um, if we could go to that opening slide. Um, oh. Thank you everyone for, uh, uh, for making it here to the end. Let's see. Uh, today, the historic houses stretching along Minatrista Boulevard stand as a testament to the rapid change and growth that came to Muncie in the late 1800s. For the Ball families of the Boulevard, the tight-knit Ball brothers, their wives and children, and large extended families, life appeared idyllic in the early 20th century. The growing families stuck together, grew in size, and integrated themselves into the business, social, and cultural life of Muncie. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll come back to this photo in a bit, so I, I won't blow past it. It likely comes as no surprise then that this landscape preserved today in Minatrista Museum and Gardens 40 acres is most closely associated with the wealthy white Ball family. However, when natural, grass, when natural gas attracted new industry to this region, creating new jobs and new wealth, it also attracted an increasingly diverse population to the Magic City. Like Muncie itself, Minatrista historically was home to a larger diverse community, one whose identities and histories deserve acknowledgement and celebration. Uh, next slide. To date, about 35 individuals who worked on the boulevard between about 1895 and 1950 have been identified. The majority of them were women, unsurprising considering that domestic service was one of the few career paths open to young women in the early 1900s, particularly young women of color. Finding them in the historical record, however, can be a bit tricky. On the fringes of the ball story at Minatrista, sometimes literally, as you can see uh, in these photographs, these hidden figures can be rediscovered and the reward of recuperating this knowledge is well worth it in the work. Uh, next slide. Searching this table, you'll find cooks, housekeepers, drivers, gardeners, nurses and domestic staff, some of whom only worked on the boulevard for a brief time, but others whose careers were spent at Minatrista, working and sometimes even making their home on the property. While it has not yet been possible to reconstruct the lives of all of these individuals, the rest of this talk will introduce three African-American women whose presence on the boulevard helped shape life at Minatrista. Uh, they're the ones highlighted. Furthermore, uh, their experiences as Black Munsonians reveal a great deal about Black life, culture, and community in Muncie, and the social struggles and triumphs that emerged as the city's population diversified throughout the 20th century. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Adeline Long came to Muncie on her own, seeking work and opportunity, finding both and love and a bit of social strife along the way. Born in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, she was one of six children raised by Ike and Addie Long, Tennessee natives born prior to the abolition of slavery in that state in 1864. Adeline and her sisters all received an education uh, taught to read and write, clearly a priority to their parents who had not had that opportunity themselves. By 1907, Adeline was in Muncie, listed in city directories working for Edmund and Bertha Ball, likely as a maid or domestic staff in the house, um, in their newly completed home, Nebosham, today the um, Edinburgh Ball Center. She was single at the time and seems to have lived in the house alongside the family. Next slide. The occasion of Adeline's marriage in 1909 seems to have marked the end of her employment on the boulevard. The remarkable details of that event, however, also give us a hint about the racial tensions then simmering in Muncie. Adeline married Illinois-born Maurice Valentine, then working as a porter in the city's segregated Elks Club in the Vatet building downtown. Apparently a well-liked employee, when news of Maurice and Adeline's nuptials reached um, Elks members, the group of Elks drove to the wedding reception and kidnapped the groom, bringing him back to uh, the clubhouse to celebrate his nuptials. As the newspaper article published a few weeks after that event noted, about 30 friends of Valentine then took charge of the groom after the ceremony and loaded him into an old spring wagon and hauled him to the Vetep building. Here he was sent to the club rooms, but he feared the fate that awaited him there and instead climbed out upon the roof. After hiding for some time, he slid down the fire escape and it is supposed rejoined his bride at an early hour um, that morning. It's a bit of a long trek down, so you can imagine that that might've been scary. Um, while this may have just been friendly hijinks misconstrued, considering the power and balance between a black porter and white club members, it's not surprising that Valentine might have briefly feared for his life. The couple stayed in Muncie a few more years uh, before moving to Detroit, I think maybe about 1916 or so, um, where they lived the rest of their lives. Next slide, please. Beyond the boulevard, many Minatrista employees made their marks on Muncie as business entrepreneurs and community leaders. Like Adeline, Louise Parrott worked at Minatrista only a few years, census records showing her employed as a housekeeper for Sarah Ball in 1940, um, and perhaps for a few years before that as well. Born in Ghent, Kentucky, to a former enslaved mother, Louise Brown, that was her maiden name, and her family immigrated to Muncie when she was just a teenager. Following her marriage to a man named William F. Parrott, the extended family, including Louise, her mother Mary, and her brother Dixie and sister Nettie, were among the earliest families to settle in Muncie's predominantly Black Whiteley neighborhood, side by side on 6th Street, uh, which was later renamed East Highland Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. From their house in Whiteley at 2024 East Highland Avenue, uh, which is the red circle on the right there, Louise and William opened their own community grocery store, one of Muncie's many early black owned businesses. Sorry. By the time William passed in 1945, Louise seems to have left her work on the boulevard to take over the store full time. Uh, which she did until about 1955, it seems, when her son came home and took it over fully. Um, she would have been in her late 60s by then, so uh, a well-deserved retirement. Active in her community and her church, Cavalry Baptist, until her death in 1964, it seems fitting that for a number of years in the late 1960s, Louise's home on Highland Avenue became the base of operations for the Whiteley Neighborhood Station a community center begun by Action Inc. A number of civil rights initiatives were discussed at the former Parrot House, including Hurley Goodall's run for the Muncie Community Schools Board of Education, um, which he ascended to in the 1970s. Um, next slide, please.
Over the course of more than five decades, staff certainly came and went at Minatrista, but some stayed, making lifetime careers of their time on the boulevard and bridging the liminal space between different parts of Muncie society. This was certainly the case for Nebo Sham employees, Fred and Mary Lamb, who we find were actually remembered in the, a bequest in Bertha Ball's will. They're highlighted the, towards the bottom um, among several um, individuals who received bequests um, when she passed. The couple worked at Nibisham for nearly 40 years, developing a closeness with the Ball family over time. Um, next slide, please. To focus in on Mary, by the time she began working on the Boulevard around 1917, she had already lived a full and somewhat turbulent life. Born in Tennessee, um, she moved to Indiana um, in her 20s and by her early 30s was twice married and divorced uh, with four little ones. Um, she wed Fred Lamb in 1907. Um, the Lambs adopted young Rosemary um, in the late 1930s. She's the young woman, I think, on the left, the far left there. Well established in their careers by then, Rosemary knew the Ball family best, um, but Bertha Ball may have played a role in some of Mary's other children's lives as well. Jessie Nixon, Mary's daughter from her second marriage, was the first African-American to graduate from Ball State Teachers College in 1925 perhaps with financial support from Bertha Ball, although that's a rumor I'm still working on finding some background for. According to Rosemary's other side of Middletown oral history, the two families were close, traveling together, playing together, um, with Bertha Ball even sending postcards to the Lambs uh, when she was away from Muncie. Uh, final slide, please. And while recognizing the affection between the balls and the lambs is wonderful, um, what is equally and perhaps more interesting is documenting the lambs ties to broader Muncie, um, particularly other black families with ties to the boulevard. For example, if you remember back to Adeline Long Valentine, um, the housemaid with the kidnapped groom, her mother-in-law, Mrs. Henry Valentine was close with Mary Lamb um, with some of their um, community celebrations even documented in the Muncie Evening Press. And in her oral history, Rosemary Lamb in describing her first job after graduating high school reveals that she, works at Parrot, uh, she worked at Parrott's Grocery Store, Louise Parrott's family store on Highland Avenue. It's a full circle story. So just to close, um, growing throughout the 1900s, Muncie's African-American community was certainly vibrant and tight-knit, and research will continue unpacking the influence of these hidden figures around Minatrista, uh, Muncie, and East Central Indiana. Thank you so much for making it to the end with me, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nayeli. Uh, I see a few things in the chat box. Also, Yvette Young has raised her hand, so <laughs> let's, let's go to her first. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, that if you would like to say anything, um, I've given you the prompt to be able to unmute yourself if you'd like. If not, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm looking at this. Uh, does it? Uh, this, this, I, this is an interesting question. How were you able to differentiate genuine relationship and household servant, servant mandated responsibilities? It's a, it's a really good question. And it's one that I think it, it sort of works on a case by case basis. Um, with Fred and Mary Lamb, the longevity of their the time that they worked um, at Nipasham is certainly unique. Um, and we do have some photographs at Minatrista of um, Mary and Rosemary sort of uh, traveling to Leland, Michigan um, with the balls, sort of going with them on the sort of these uh, summer excursions. It's a little bit of both. I think they certainly had a very um, fruitful sort of longstanding working relationship, but it seems to have sort of crossed beyond that to a certain point with this particular um, group of people just because of how long they were associated with each other. 
Um, but that's always back and forth with these kinds of power dynamics. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other questions for Nayeli or any of our other speakers? Okay. Well, thank you all. I know I learned something this evening. Uh, but before we go, I'm going to ask Melissa to talk about a couple of upcoming um, events that we have. So Melissa, could you speak to uh, the Notable Women presentations in March and the blogathon? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and advance, there we go. Um, so we're having an in-person event at the Student Center. It's during Ball State University Women's Week. Um, and uh, we're going to have um, a presentation just like that, like the one tonight, except in person, which is exciting. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> it's it's that Monday night, March 21st at seven o'clock. It's going to be in the music lounge in the student center. Um, and at seven o'clock, you can find um, parking on campus, which is good. <laughs> um, and then if you want to advance to the next slide, we're going to host a blogathon. Um, the Indiana State Library hosted a blogathon, so we wanted to steal their idea and um, the blogathon. Um, anyone can show up and choose a card. Um, we're going to have cards of the, uh, the 400 women that we have listed on our Notable Women database. And you can do a little research here at university libraries and write a little something about the women instead of all of us writing about them. So, and then we're going to post those onto um, our website and our Instagram. And there will be a Target and Starbucks gift card drawing. So a little incentive to come and write for the notable women. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Uh, if we don't have any uh, questions or comments, I'd like to thank our speakers again and thank all of our audience who attended. Uh, this will be hosted on the Ball State University Digital Libraries, uh, where you'll be able to hear us again if you'd like. And <laughs> Nayeli, you, <laughs> you have something to say? <laughs> Just for the question that ended up there at the end, um, the other side of Middletown book, um, is great for this particular history. It's, it's the sort of culmination of the oral history project that was done in the 2000s. Um, and it has a lot of great information in there about Muncie's African-American community. It's uh, Luke Eric Lassiter, the other side of Middletown. And if you do have an, Insta if you do have an Instagram account, um, if you go to the Muncie Notables, uh, last February, we did a post every day of, of Black History okay. Month about different African-American women. Um, and then we've done um, multiple posts this year too. And also um, Hurley Goodall uh, had written some books um, in partnership with Muncie Public Library called Those Who Went Before. I think there's at least two volumes of that, um, which also has a lot of uh, notable women um, and newspaper clippings and other resources there as well. And Hurley collaborated with uh, with Eric Campbell and his wife, Beth, on the other side of Middletown too. So uh, all good information. So anyway, again, thank you all for coming and we hope to see you next month in person. So good night. Okay.